Boris's Russian connections. What are they? How deep do they go? Why should we even care? I can answer that question straight away. Anything that gives Putin access to high-profile British politicians should worry us. This is a threat to our country and frankly it looks more and more as if we've been sold out by incompetent and corrupt politicians. And if these allegations turn out to be true, which I will touch on, Boris has given a Putin sympathiser born in Russia more access to power than the average British citizen. Is Johnson a threat to national security? Well, there have been a few situations that frankly should leave alarm bells ringing. With Putin assaulting the Ukraine, the events you're about to hear raise serious questions. For a start, Boris has denied that there was any Russian interference in any British election. 20th of November, Boris denies there's any Russian interference. Absolutely no evidence that I've ever seen of any uh, Russian in interference in UK democratic processes. And as 22nd of November, Boris denies there's any Russian interference, comparing it to that of the Bermuda Triangle. Whether or not there was Russian interference or any kind of yeah, There is absolutely uh, no evidence uh, that I know to show any interference in the in then any British happen? electoral event. And the but there was interference and he had read the report and lied to the British public about the interference in British elections on multiple occasions. Johnson has been slow in seizing Russian oligarch assets. All Russian money pumped into the Conservative Party has not been returned. There are reluctance to allow Ukrainian refugees in, but they're happy to give visas to rich Russian oligarchs. Boris has refused to shut down the TV station RT, Russia Today, a Putin propaganda machine, and was forced to by the EU and Apple. Check out my video on this, Putin's war on the West explained. So let's go back to the main question. What are Boris's Russian connections? Boris has Russian friends with deep links to the Putin regime. Evgeny Lebedev and his father Alexander Lebedev. Evgeny Lebedev has an interesting history starting with his father, Alexander Lebedev. As bent as a Soviet sickle and as hard as a hammer that crosses it, a former KGB spy turned billionaire oligarch with investments in the Crimea. But is it fair to take aim at someone for their father's actions? Of course not. But if the son's actions and the father's actions are not great and often side with the Putin narrative, then we do have cause for concern. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Evgeny Lebedev is a 41-year-old businessman who owns the Independent and the Evening Standard as well as being in the House of Lords, Lord of Siberia. 2009, a year after Boris became mayor, Alexander Lebedev bought the Evening Standard. On June 6, 2009, the Lebedevs threw a black tie fundraiser at Stud House, their home near Hampton Court Palace, West London, to raise money for a cancer charity set up in memory of Mikhail Gorbachev's wife. The star of the show was Gorbachev, who had been the leader of the Soviet Union during Lebedev's senior's time as a spy in London and subsequently built a friendship with him. Other guests included Johnson, who was seated next to Evgeny. It was the start of a friendship. And on August 3rd, the pair went for lunch at the Blueprint Cafe, a fashionable restaurant near Tower Bridge overlooking the Thames. They started a text and call each other regularly. How do we know this? Because we have records from the mayor's office. Johnson had spotted an opportunity in a man who was desperate to please, build contacts and make his way in Britain. With his father based in Russia, Evgeny quickly acquired responsibility for the running of the Standard and the Independent. During 2010, the Lebedevs wanted a Russian festival to be held in London every year. Johnson threw open the doors of City Hall to make it happen, offering his advice and assistance, and according to Minutes, Lebedev said he would lead discussions in establishing further substantial support from the Russian government, at that time the Putin government. Johnson expressed concern about any suggestion that the festival might glorify the Soviet era, but was relaxed about Russia under Putin who had recently completed his second term as president and had ordered radioactive material be dumped across London in order to kill Alexander Litvinenko. All agreed that what is worthy of a celebration is Russia now. Johnson's plan was to encourage as many oligarchs as possible to settle and spend money in London, trickle-down economics. He even broke publicly with the government's policy at the time on libel tourism. Johnson said Russian billionaires should be encouraged to use British courts to settle disputes. 
I have no shame in saying to the injured spouses, the world's billionaires, if you want to take him to the cleaners, take him to the cleaners in London. Because London cleaners will be grateful for your business. Yet by 2022, Johnson's government vowed to clamp down on the use of lawfare and the British assets of these same individuals. 2012. Lebedev standard threw its weight behind Johnson's re-election campaign, backing him on the front page, calling him the right choice for London. It could be argued that it is perfectly normal for a mayor to want to woo the owner of a newspaper with significant influence in London. Lebedev was perfectly entitled to bestow hospitality and gifts on Johnson, as long as it was all declared, which, ranging from lunches to a gift of Samuel Johnson's diary, it was. After Johnson's re-election, the relationship changed. Johnson started travelling to Palazzo Terranova, the Lebedev's villa in Italy, often flying commercially or on private jets paid for by the Russian. According to previous guests, such parties are not easily forgotten. Vodka and caviar flowed. Dinner is followed by music and dancing. Stephen Fry, Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson have been seen at some events. However, Alexander Lebedev's Activities in Umbria have been linked to espionage and interference in a book published in 2021 by Jacopo Lacaboni, a financial reporter for the newspaper La Stampa, Oligarchy. How Putin's friends are buying Italy cited an Italian intelligence report that includes allegations that Lebedev Sr. had been involved in attempts by Gazprom, you might have heard of them due to the Ukrainian war, and its largest shareholder, the Kremlin to influence the energy politics of foreign governments. It includes details casting doubt on whether he ever fully severed his ties with the Russian intelligence agencies. Evgeny denied the allegations against his father. Johnson visited Perugia every October for five years, from 2012 to 2016. He would sometimes even bring his wife. Documents showed he accepted £7,150 worth of flights, cars and accommodation from Lembedev between 2013 and 15 justifying them in hand-signed expensive returns as networking events. Evgeny made no secret of his political views. He used Twitter and occasional columns in the Evening Standard and Independent to promote views resembling the Kremlin line on matters ranging from assassinations to the war in Syria. 2013. On August 10th, he tweeted, Was Litvinenko murdered by MI6? Certainly more to it than the generally accepted Putin link. In 2007, the Crown Prosecution Service charged Andrei Lugovi, a former KGB agent, with the murder of Litvinenko. The CPS had charged a second Russian, Dmitry Kovtun, as Lugoy's accomplice. In 2022, Litvinenko's widow Marina called for an investigation into Lebedev's peerage. She said he knows it's a conspiracy theory to suggest MI6 was behind her husband's assassination. Asked whether his peerage should be reviewed now, she said, I think it should because I disagreed from the very beginning of this. It should not be explained as Russiaphobia, not at all. Of course, I am against any Russiaphobia. 2014, he appeared to downplay the severity of Putin's actions in the Russian invasion of Crimea. In March, he had used a column in the Evening Standard to say that most Russians thank Putin for previously unimaginable freedoms and a regained sense of national pride. He also claimed that the Crimea may now function least dysfunctionally. As a Russian-speaking independent nation, this culturally and historically Russian blob jetting out into the Black Sea from the Ukrainian shores. A few days later, Lebedev defended the invasion on the Andrew Marsh show. Apart from the newspapers and so on, of course, you own a lot of property in the Crimea. Do you still own a lot of property in the Crimea? Are you worried about your holdings there? And what do you think of what's going on there? Yes, still own properties in Crimea, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, I am very concerned, but I think what I would say is that uh, it's very complicated and textured subject that a lot of the time is misunderstood in the West. And um, Crimea, what people don't realize, has been for many, many years, many centuries, part of Russia, and only very recently part of Ukraine. So even though I would say that the referendum may have not been held under the right circumstances, I think if you think it was a genuine, I, th I think vote. the uh, the actual outcome of the vote would have been the same. One thing I would say is that yesterday we've seen that Russia has reached out to the West, and I think now it's time to stop uh, Cold War rhetoric on both sides and start talking. The Cold War is over. Let's not start another one. And in the middle of that Cold War rhetoric, um, do you think there was a lot of? I mean, you must talk to them. A lot of worry, a bit of a shiver going through the oligarchs in London about what was going to happen to them and their position here. 
Well, to be very honest with you, Andrew, I, I don't really speak to a lot of oligarchs in London, but I think if sanctions were to go any further, I think the city of London and London, London's economy would have been affected. But I think now um, there is not going to be any further incursions into any land, and not, def not, not, um, not eastern Crimea and definitely not anywhere further. So I think it's now, now time to talk. April 30th, Lebedev posted an article about Russia's invasion of the Crimea entitled it's not Russia that's pushed Ukraine to the brink of war. In it, Lebedev's writer, Milne, blamed NATO for the conflict, said Putin's actions were clearly defensive and welcomed Russia's role as a counterweight to US imperialism. Where else have we heard this? Nigel Farage. The Russian invasion of Ukraine. What do you think about it? I have to say, I do think for 30 years, ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall, this constant expansion of the European Union and NATO has been a geopolitical error. Following the overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych, the former Ukrainian president and Putin ally, Lebedev acknowledged that he had been far from perfect, but nevertheless democratically elected. It is not surprising that the far-right elements of this Ukrainian revolution will worry Russians, and must worry their president. Similar arguments used by Putin have been used to justify the invasion of Ukraine, by vowing to denazify the country. Быстро приобрел форму агрессивной русофобии и неонацизма. 2015. In September, as Putin became involved in Syria, Lebedev said that Putin had shown leadership in the conflict and urged the West to accept his offer of an anti-ISIS coalition. This was dubbed the Grand Bargain. Western leaders were calling for unity in Syria, their plans unlike Putin's. They did not envisage Bashar al-Assad, the brutal Syrian president, remaining in power. 2016. With the EU referendum approaching, Lebedev met Michael Gove at Boris Johnson's Islington home and the three decided to back Brexit. Two sources alleged Lebedev then tried to persuade Sands, the Evening Standard editor, to back leaving the EU as well. She apparently refused. 2018. Weeks after Sergei Skripal was poisoned in Salisbury and toxic waste dumped across Salisbury, Johnson went to Italy without his close protection officers. Johnson has never provided an account of the visit or explained why he went. One of those who worked with Johnson said, I was aware of Boris's relationship with Lebedev. It struck me as a little odd. It seemed to me to be someone who carried a certain amount of risk. I don't think there was anything sinister. I think he, Boris, just thinks he's not doing anything untoward and doesn't see why he should adjust his own behaviour. 2019, 24 hours after winning the landslide general election in December, Johnson attended Alexander Lebedev's 60th birthday party, an event that doubled as a Christmas do and an election celebration. By this point, Johnson made it known to his aides at number 10 that he intended to nominate Evgeny Lebedev for a peerage. One said he started speaking about it almost immediately after arriving in Downing Street. He pathologically wanted to get his peerage over the line. They added, it was Lebedev's need of a peerage. He needs a peerage. It was immediate. After putting forward the nomination, the House of Lords Appointments Commission Secretariat set about vetting Lebedev. The process involves contacting various agencies from HMRC, the Metropolitan Police, MI5 and MI6, to determine whether there was any potential disqualifying information. Traditionally, HMRC will give a green, amber or red light to signify its level of approval. The security services are more subtle, but in this case their verdict was clear. They informed the Secretariat that they had national security concerns about Lebedev. March 17th, the House of Lords wrote to Johnson saying the Commission could not support Lebedev and suggesting he back someone else. Johnson immediately expressed his objections to his most senior aides. He declared it must be Russiaphobia and demanded something be done about the situation. 48 hours later, the same day that he gave a speech in which he told Britons they must stay at home if possible to tackle COVID, he met with Lebedev. According to a source, Johnson demanded that the security service provide a specific reason, in other words, a smoking gun, demonstrating why his good friend Lebedev was not a suitable figure to sit in the Lords. Civil servants were stunned. They said it was unprecedented for a Prime Minister to question such an assessment, 
and that the system of vetting only worked if politicians heeded the advice of the security services. They also said Johnson's response mistook the nature of such intelligence, which is based on the risk a person might pose, more than one past deed or event. In any case, intelligence officials are thought to have told Johnson that there was not one specific reason to block him. That was enough for Johnson to re-nominate Lebedev. A few issues remained, however not least because the nominee wanted to name himself Lord Lebedev of Moscow. Having been told no, he then tried again for Hampton Court. Both were blocked, instead Lebedev was welcomed into the chamber as Lord Lebedev of Hampton in the London Borough of Richmond upon Thames, and of Siberia in the Russian Federation. The only way Lebedev could get that name of Siberia attached to his as Lord was by getting permission from Vladimir Putin. Since joining the chamber in 2020, Lebedev has not contributed in a single debate or cast a single vote. He has submitted two questions, both shortly after an article appeared questioning his contributions. Before we get to 2020, what do you think? Boris's Russian connections are either someone who has sympathies with Putin, or is a Putin asset. Either way, he's not liked by British security services, which in itself says something, and we have it on record Lebedev has links to Putin, and also toes Putin party lines. If you want to find out more on this, you have to watch a series of my videos on Russian interference in the UK, as well as Putin's overall goal, where I've pieced together timelines of actions by Putin and his attack on the UK and the West. Putin clearly uses rich Russians to gain access into governments across the world, and by my calculation, for as little as 300 million. Has this video made you care about the state of British politics? In all my years of study, I've never witnessed such a monumental attack on our democracy. And considering Brexiteers have love of the ideas of sovereignty and democracy, I find their lack of patriotism and their lack of attacks on Boris and Farage bordering on pathetic. I want to say a big, big thank you to everyone who is a Patreon supporter and has bought me a coffee in the past. This all helps with continuing and maintaining the standards of the channel. 2022. In March, Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, has written to the Commission urging it to review the peerage. The accusations made by Lord Lebedev that the British security services had any involvement in the murder of Alexander Litvinenko is insulting. I have seen firsthand the real impact of Russian interference in Britain and the difficulties prosecutors encounter when dealing with those who act on behalf of Putin. This is clearly a matter of national security. Evgeny Lebedev wrote in the Evening Standard to dismiss claims about him, saying he was not some Russian agent or a security risk. He dismissed speculation in the media, said he opposed Putin's invasion of Ukraine and denied interfering in the editorial coverage of his papers. He also warned against descending into Russophobia like any other phobia, bigotry or discrimination. His father, who is now in Moscow, has not spoken. Number 10 continues to insist that Lebedev was given a peerage due to his charitable work and contribution to society and public service. A government spokesman said, All individuals nominated for a peerage are done so in recognition of their contribution to society, and all peerages are vetted by the House of Lords. 